I ask for your forgiveness. I'm not going to wear my mask because I want you to hear me. Um, it's not a political statement or anything. It's just <laughs> expedient. And Bill, just a second, and I might need your help on this. Um, when I first came up with the idea for this program, we were on a committee that was supposed to celebrate the 100th anniversary of the woman's right to vote all year. And I was at a meeting and said, oh, we ought to talk about quilts. Um, I forgot about it until I got the volunteer newsletter and saw that I was giving a quilt talk. <laughs> and then I tried to kind of look at some of the talks I'd given before and relate them to the women's movement. And it wasn't that easy. So I was going to start out by saying, Bill, don't ever talk me into doing anything again. <laughs> until I realized I did it to myself. So um, Bill can't blame, but what I want, I, Bill cannot be blamed, but I want him to stick around for two seconds because I want to make sure I get this right. When you do a talk like this in a place of historical significance, you want to make sure that what you say is, is based on history. Ruth Mayer does not like you to make up history. <laughs> the problem with doing a talk on quilts is most of the quote unquote history of quilts is basically folklore. And when I looked to try to make sure I could explain the difference between folklore and history, the first quote I saw was that folklore is a bunch of lies that don't hurt anybody. And I thought, eh, I don't know about that. So the... So you're asking for license? <laughs> so what I'm going to say that the best definition I found of folklore, it's a type of history with a common group, learned informality, often binding, applied differently, because everybody has a different interpretation of the story, but traditionally, so you develop a common thread. So when I do this, I'm gonna try really hard to differentiate between what's history and what is folklore. And I just- I'm not, I'm, I'm not Oh, okay. Well, I know, but I just wanted to make sure well, that you say, understood. I will say this. Folklore is one of my favorite things, and I think it's very entertaining and very engaging and very fun. That's why people are just drawn to it like a magnet, and that's why it sticks around so well. So, so you know, sure, I appreciate your dedication to, to doing good history and to defining when we're on maybe shaking ground or not. Um, well, I, I don't... I don't want, you know, historians to come back, especially yeah. since this is being taped and said, there's no proof I think of... Given all, our proper disclaimers all right, okay. Well, I'm going to start out by talking about how I got interested in quilts. And um, this was, this actually is not the quilt. This belonged to my husband's family, but my, and the quilt that my grandmother made has gotten too fragile to, to bring. But this, um, is a quilt that was handed down through their family. And my mom, in a similar one, when I was little, you know, by that time it had gotten to the point where we were using it for picnics and, you know, it wasn't treasured as such. She would go through when I was a little girl and she'd point out fabrics and she'd go, well, my grandfather had a shirt made of this and I had a dress made of this and my grandmother made an ap apron of this and that kind of instilled in me the fact that you get a lot of history through quilts. And I have another quilt at home that my father's mother made when she was dying of ovarian cancer back in the 30s when he was like 13. And she did that as a gift to be handed down, you know, a part of her that could be handed down to other generations. And I really, really treasure those quilts. My mother didn't quilt. Her mother didn't quilt. There was really nobody in the family that quilted, but I always knew that I wanted to do a quilt. I wanted to learn about quilts and I was fascinated. The first quilt I tried to make with no instruction was a total disaster. I, it was so bad that I didn't even give it to a charity group. You know, it just kind of went into the trash a couple years ago. But um, I became determined that I was gonna learn how to quilt. And when I started learning how to quilt, I discovered that there are two problems with me quilting. One, I have a very short attention span. And so I would start out to make these queen size bed quilts 
and about four rows in, I'd go, oh, if I have to look at this pattern one more time, I'm going to shoot myself. And, so, and then the other thing I discovered is I was a lot more interested in the history behind the quilt than I was in the actual quilting. I mean, it was fun piecing, but again, once I got the pattern established and so forth, so I decided that I was going to drive myself crazy if I kept trying to make these big, expensive quilts. And I went to smaller things that illustrated some point. So um, as I'm trying to organize my thoughts for this presentation, I finally decided that there were kind of four common threads with quilting. First one was fellowship. Women tended to quilt in groups because um, in those days, 100 years ago, that was probably about one of their only means of being able to socialize. It was a connection, particularly for rural people, you know, who didn't have a next door neighbor right next door. Um, they were considered a functional hobby and men tended to think quilting bees were just kind of trivial social events. You know, oh, she's going off to her quilting bee. Another thread I found in quilting was the, philanth the philanthropy um, aspect. Women discovered that they could finance causes that they believed in through making quilts, or they could make quilts that, that advertised a political belief or something that they couldn't necessarily express. And a lot of times for the war and so forth, and I'll talk about that, they sold their quilts to raise money. Um, Another thread was means of expression. You know, in some cases, you know, that was the only way that, um, that women had to express themselves. Very early on, they weren't taught to read, they weren't taught to write. So they could express their creativity, and in some cases their views, through quilting. That was something that was safe to them. And then as women became more and more of a powerful force, and this may be the most interesting aspect, it became a real marketing um, tool. And I want to talk about some of the ways that, um, that businesses latched onto this and made, this, um, made quilting and um, uh, marketing endeavor. First quilt I want to talk about isn't an American quilt, and Joy is going to, I apologize, I don't have a PowerPoint, but my computer is 10 years old. And I'm her PowerPoint. She's my PowerPoint. I'm powerful and I'm having a point. So. <laughs> um, the first quilt that I have is, was done in 1841 by a group of 30 convict women um, who are being transported from England to Australia. Um, they were, um, it's called the Raja quilt because they were on the ship Raja. And I kind of got interested in the whole aspect of why these women were being shipped to another continent and found out that um, at the time, Britain, well, it's right after the Industrial Revolution, a lot of people were out of work because their jobs had been taken over by machines. London and a lot of the big cities were really overcrowded. And so um, they started basically arresting people and sending them to the convict co colonies, and Australia was a big one. One out of seven convicts that, that were transported were women, and most of those were for petty crime. Immediately I thought, well, they must have been prostitutes, but they weren't. Prostitution was not transmitted or transferable. Um, it was for theft, petty theft or something, and I'm thinking these poor women are just trying to steal to feed their families and they're getting shipped to another country. Um, there were, um, oh, over a 25 year period, 12,000 women were transported on 106 ships. Well, there was a group of women that, called, that were called, was called the British Ladies Society, and they were appalled that these poor women were being sent, you know, on these long journeys, and found out they were terrified when they were wait, waiting to deport. So they um, approached the British Navy and convinced them to let them take gifts to the women um, the night before they set sail, just to kind of, and to try to comfort them. And the gifts consisted of things like um, knives, forks, aprons, and sewing materials. Well, the one group happened to have, uh, uh, she was the only free woman on the ship, and she was being sent over so she could organize uh, 
uh, kind of a separate chapter of this group in Australia. So she organized these ladies and they created that quilt to say thank you. It was presented to the uh, wife of the governor of Australia and um, she in turn presented it to the um, president of the Women's Association saying thank you for, um, for providing this for us. And I thought that was just kind of a neat story and a really early example of quilt sending a message. The quilt is now held in the National Gallery in Australia, and um, it's kind of gone back and forth a few times. And you know there is a, you know, a heartfelt mes message embroidered on the quilt. Okay, the next phase that shows um, philanthropy was during the abolition movement in the Civil War. Um, even before 1830, quilts were made to raise funds for the abolitionist movement. A lot of times, they were sold at auctions and held to raise money at local fairs. In some cases, women paid to have their name um, put on the quilt. And that could either be done by um, handiwork, but they, we did have indelible ink back then. I didn't realize that and that kind of surprise. So to defray the cost of expenses, a woman might pay 10 cents to have the honor of putting a na her name on the quilt. And then the quilt would be held at um, the county, or the auction would be held at the county fair. The most kind of controversial um, story from that movement was the um, Underground Railroad quilts. And um, I was intrigued by this because I took a, I, I was tired of kind of tired of history by the time I got to college, wanted to take history from a different perspective. So I, I was at IU, they were starting the Black Studies Movement. I took a course called History of Slavery because I thought that's something that we never talked about, you know, in high school. And the woman that taught the course spent a whole session one night talking about Underground Railroad quilts and how they were used. Now this is folklore because a true historian will say there's no evidence whatsoever you know, nobody ever identified their quilt as being used on the Underground Railroad. There was a point back in the 80s and early 90s where somebody, you know, people jumped onto this because it had come in the news because you had historians saying it didn't happen. You had quilters saying, yes, it did. And so if that kind of became a, a time, and I didn't bring the book with me, but this was a quilt where, you know, supposedly all of these, all of these, um, patterns or these blocks had a message. You know, one was this was the, the wheel that meant that there's a there's a train leaving, and so get your stuff together and so forth. I honestly don't believe it was that sophisticated, but the two things that probably come um, closest to having validity. You know, part of the problem is if I'm if I'm a spot on the Underground Railroad, I'm not going to talk about it. And after the war is over, I'm probably not going to advertise it. So what they would do, if you were willing to house a family or a group, you did a log cabin quilt. Most log cabin quilts have a red block in the center. This one's black. So if you're, you know, you're escaping, you know, the um, people that are coming after you, you see a quilt hanging on a porch that has a black spot in the middle, you know that's a safe place where you can get help. The other um, block that seems to have more validity is this one, and that's called a shoe fly. A shoe fly was a person that kind of organized the next leg of the trip. And um, when um, Frederick Douglass died, they found like a dozen shoe fly quilts in his attic you know, that people had given to him out of tribute. So um, this is folklore. There's nothing written. It's basically oral history, but most of it comes out of the South and it, and it makes sense to me. And, um, you know, there's another theory. There was a book, a children's book that was written that, that is, you know, Sweet, Sweet Clara and the Underground Railroad. And supposedly the grandmother teaches Clara 
you know, how to make this quilt, and it's a crazy quilt, and it has all these lines, and what she's doing is memorizing a map to the north. You know, I don't think so. I mean, there, you know, there were not maps on the Underground Railroad. You know, there were just kind of sign po posts. So that's kind of what I found out when I've tried to learn the history of quilting. You know, a lot of things are, um, are kind of myths, but they're interesting myths. Around the history of the, the um, few years ago, when we were talking a lot about the Civil War, um, there was a resurgent in Civil War quilts. Now, at this point, I'd gotten smart. I realized I'm never going to make a big quilt. Well, I have made a couple, but it's unlikely. And Yoder's in Shipshawana was doing a class on Civil War um, quilts. And a lot of the fabric companies came up with reproduction fabrics. So this is one of these. I'm trying to think whether I have the pattern name. I finally got around to labeling this. This is just a regular four square. But these are all rep reproduction um, patterns. And this particular class, you didn't try to attempt big quilts. You just went with the miniatures. This is another. I think these fabrics are beautiful. And um, they did have the dyes and so forth. This one's just called scrappiness. But a lot of the Civil War quilts were made of scraps. You know, a group of ladies would pool their scraps so that they had enough to, to make a quilt. And um, they auctioned the quilts to support the war. I thought it was kind of interesting. The women in the North, um, they, they auctioned the quilt to do supplies for the soldiers. In the South, they were raising money for gunboats. So it was just kind of the, the difference um, in need. And then these are, this is another one I thought was really pretty, Civil War, Civil War fabrics. So, um, you know, this was a little bit more practical because, for one thing, it wasn't so expensive. And I was just kind of doing this to learn the history, not necessarily to, um, to cover my bed. I have another, another one. This would have been probably more typical of, um, of a quilt that a woman might send with her husband or a brother who is a soldier um, because it doesn't have the color in it. You know, you, it's, it was easy to get muslin. A lot of times it wasn't easy to get the printed fabric. And I didn't realize, I guess I envisioned until I took this class, these ladies weaving the cloth and dyeing it and all of that. They had commercial fabrics at that point. You know, they could, they could go to the general store and buy it or the, you know, the, the wagon peddlers would come by and, and sell fabric. That's how they had time to quilt. The early pioneers didn't have time to quilt because they were too busy making the materials. But um, these are all production fabrics. And this is, you know, a representation of what a Civil War quilt might have looked like. Um, depending on how much time they had to prepare, um, they might rework a quilt and make it into two quilts, or they might make a cot quilt. That was supposed to be a cot quilt because it was kind of long and narrow because they didn't need, you know, a big double quilt um, when they went off to war. Okay. So this is where I got myself in trouble. And that was trying to really relate this to the women's movement. And I discovered some interesting things. Um, early on in the suffrage movement, quilting bees were where a lot of the early suffragettes went to talk to women. Yeah, women were not necessarily congregating outside of their house. Their husbands might be suspicious of them getting together in groups at night, but quilting was just this harmless thing, you know, let them go quilt. And the one thing I found out that Susan B. Anthony really was an accomplished quilter. Um, she has several of her quilts are stored at the Susan B. Anthony Museum, and I have a picture of a quilt that she actually did. She was 15 years old when she did that. It's the Lemoyne Square. 
Um, about five years ago, the ladies that are looking at that quilt are a quilting group from Kansas that agreed to reproduce the quilt because they couldn't display it anymore because it had gotten so fragile. So they had the material made, they reproduced the quilt. So now if you go to the Susan B. Anthony Museum, you'll see a quilt displayed. It's not the original, but it's um, a pretty good representation of that. Um, the original quilt is in the Rochester Museum and Science Center. And um, the, the copy quilt is in her um, birthplace and museum. You know, for a lot of women, that was the first time that they had a chance to really realize what their rights could, you know, could uh, potentially be. And um, it, it was a way, you know, again, for them to be communicated to. Um, Lucretia Mott, another name in, um, in the suffrage movement, was also a quilter. And there is, um, she had several quilts. I guess she was a pretty prolific quilter. But here's an example of one that's actually in, um, in her museum. And I picked this one because I thought it was really interesting. It, it's got like ties on the side and a font that comes down. So it must have, you know, it must have either covered the back or the foot of the bed. You know, I don't know for warmth or whatever. I've never seen a quilt. Um, done quite that way. And again, I don't want to make up history, so I'm going to um, double check. Her quilts are in care of the Nantucket Historical Association in Nantucket, Massachusetts. Now, I don't have a picture of this one, but I thought one of the most interesting stories was Carrie Nation. And Carrie Nation was the person that was largely responsible for the temperance movement. And um, she was a little crazy by all accounts. I mean, there was some mental illness in her family. And, you know, as she got older, she got a little bit crazier. And she was the one that was famous for going into, into saloons and basically throwing rocks and destroying all the liquor. And um, she, she'd just wipe out the stock. Well, her husband, I guess, kind of, you know, cheek, you know, in cheek and hand or whatever, said, well, you know, you'd be more effective if you used a hatchet. And so she started carrying a hatchet with her. And part of the way that she raised her money for this temperance campaign was selling little souvenir hatchets. Supposedly, around that time when the Women's Christian Temperance Union was formed, they, one of the patterns that they talked about, they would make quilts again in groups, again sign their name to it for a fee, and um, sell them to raise money for the cause. And I just thought it was, I, I had to tell that story because I thought, here you have this woman that's selling souvenir hatchets that's getting funded by quilting bees. And there's no direct relationship to the fact that the tea met temperance. However, there's a whole lot of tea quilts, I guess, from that era. So that's another one where there's some, you know, some license. Another pattern they used, you don't need to take these around because okay. The only, the other pattern that they used was the drunkard's path. And that was on um, a lot of the temperance quilts as well. So um, I guess my husband's grandmother was a, a pillar in the women's Christian temperance movement. But um, I didn't find any quilts when we went through their house after she died. Um, The Liberty Tree Quilt is, this is housed at um, Michigan State. And this has kind of got a dual purpose. This was done, and you can take this one around, as it, it honors Civil War battles. 
But in the top, it says, abstain from harsh drink. So they were trying to get two messages. They, they were trying to honor, you know, honor the war, but, um, but again, sending a message, you know, beware of the booze. <laughs> now, my apologies to Ruth Neer. In the thing promoting, or in the, the, the um, information promoting my talk was this quilt, a picture of this quilt. And I looked at it, and I'll have Joy turn it around. I'm going to talk about this for quite a while. But anyway, um, and I thought, you know, I've seen that before, and I know I have. I absolutely cannot remember. It might have been at the Art Institute a couple years ago when they had um, a display at a quilt display. But, you know, I looked at it, and it's so vibrant and so... Um, I don't know, kind of out there that, you know, I knew I remembered it. So I was talking to Linda when I was telling her how I was getting ready for the talk. Mm. And I said, I've got this quilt that I know I've seen somewhere. Well, then I turned to the web page to find um, the time to tell her exactly when to come. And there's the quilt. And I'm going, oh, I know I saw it somewhere other than there. If you Google, it's called the Cleveland Hendrick, Cleveland Hendrick's Crazy Quilt. If you Google women's movement quilts, that's the first thing that's going to show up. I mean, that was the first thing I saw. And I thought, wow, you know, this is a true example of a quilt to promote the women's movement. Okay, but then when I did the research, this is what I found out. The maker of the quilt is unknown, but she showed her political sympathies in the only means available to her at that time. The strutting rooster in the center was a symbol used during the 1890s and 1990s by the Democratic Party. So she was obviously a Democrat. Below the rooster are portraits of two unsuccessful Democratic presidential candidates, Samuel J. Tilden and Winfred Hancock, who ran in 1876 and 1880. Their portraits were saved from campaign banners until Grover Cleveland and Thomas Hendricks um, won in 1884. Their pictures are in the upper right-hand corner of the block. And then there's an inaugural, uh, 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 Cleveland Hendricks inaugural ribbon placed above. So I thought, oh, wow, you know, Grover Cleveland must have been really you know, pro-women's rights. So again, I did research, and his most famous quote was, sensible and responsible women do not want to vote. And the other thing that I found that I couldn't make a copy of, I tried, and it's so protected, you know, that you can't make a copy, is a, a cartoon that was really popular during that time. And it's a cartoon of him holding a book that says, all I know about women and Susan B. Anthony is chasing him with a rolling pin, <laughs> and Uncle Sam is in the background laughing. So I'm thinking, she must have been anti, you know, women's rights if she was celebrating his, his election. And, and I guess that's an example how sometimes when, you know, when you get into something like quilting or something that's mostly, you know, folklore, you can really interpret. You know, one of the early books I bought that I just kind of glanced, I didn't really look at it, was a book celebrating, I don't I think I brought it, but it was, um, oh, it, this one was okay. It was the second one, Voices of the Past. And I thought it was going to show quilts and quilt blocks that people like Susan B. Anthony and so forth made. Well, there's a, bla there's a block honoring Jackie Kennedy. And I just can't see her as a quilter. So a lot of them were just, you know, they kind of were created to sell books, you know, in other words. And I guess that's an example of the, the marketing. Um, so anyway, that, um, that so much for um, Grover Cleveland. Fellowship. Uh, again, we've talked about that. Um, in some respect, 
as people moved westward, um, quilting became even more important because quilts served a lot of, per a lot of different purposes on the, in the wagon trains. And what would traditionally happen is that um, a group would get together if a family was leaving. It took some time to prepare. And the women would make quilts. And the quilts would, um, this is one of the bigger ones that I did. Um, the quilts would serve dual purposes, or really a lot of purposes. They would provide warmth in the wagon train. They would provide warmth for the family. They'd be used to wrap dishes and things that they didn't want to break. Um, sometimes they were even used for burial if somebody died on the, on the trip. And this is, you know, this is made out of reproduction fabrics from that time period. And each of these stars, now this is something that was created, you know, basically to sell the book, but it was kind of, it was at least based on history. Each of these represented a state in the, on the journey. And then when, you know, when the wagon train, you know, when they got to their destination and, you know, they had, they were more or less settled, it was again a way of um, women to get together and, you know, and socialize and provide support to each other. Okay, I'm getting there. And um, I'll put, if you want to look at this afterwards, you can see what the different, um, the different blocks are. Okay, means of expression, probably the most important component. In the late 18th century and in the early years of the 19th, women were too busy spinning, weaving, clothing their family to, um, to have time to quilt. Commercial blankets were more practical and that's what the pioneers used. Um, the only people that had time to quilt were the very wealthy people. And um, they would do just simple quilts out of a fabric called Lindsay Woolen, Woolsey. That was a combination of wool and linen. Um, or they would do Baltimore block quilts. And that's an example of a Baltimore block. I have the materials to make one. I just haven't gotten around to do it. I'm a master at preparation. My follow through leaves a little bit to be desired. Um, in America, the um, Victorian age was a little bit after Queen Victoria's time and crazy quilts became the thing. And this is a modern version of a crazy quilt that I made, but they used little scraps of fabrics. You know, if you had a dressmaker or something for a very wealthy woman, you would woman, you would collect the scraps, you know, silks and velvets and so forth, and make just strictly a decorative quilt. You wouldn't um, sleep under this. And that this was a class I made, I took to learn how to make um, crazy quilts. I machine stitched my stitches, not, I didn't do it the old fashioned way. Best example, most interested, well, and I, what I didn't realize was that um, crazy, crazy quilts were inspired by the Philadelphia World's Fair in 1876 by the Japanese Pavilion, because that was the first time a lot of people had seen you know, that oriental type of, of art. This is, I think, the most interesting story quilt. And it's a picture of a jigsaw puzzle because I, I found out about this, um, this quilt at a puzzle store in Shipshawana. It was um, completed in 1867 by a woman by the name of Lucinda Ward Hanstein. She lived in Brooklyn from 1825 to 1904, and it tells the story of her life before and after the war. Central block shows her house and her farm. It's a wagon with the family business's name on it. Her son was a, 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 in, the, in the Navy during the war. So there's blocks with the Navy or with a man in a Navy uniform and a ship. Um, she was obviously an abolitionist because there's a picture of um, Jefferson Davis and his daughter when he gets out of pr prison. And when they did research on this, they found out her, her family had been slave owners, but after they, um, 
after, uh, until 1827, um, but the former state slaves um, stuck around. So some of those squares so, sh so show black men in, in business endeavors. So um, they stayed in the area and I guess um, lived near the family. That, um, that quilt is now in um, University of Nebraska. It was sold at Sotheby's in 1991, and it was the highest price ever, been, ever being spent on a quilt. It sold for $264,000. Okay, marketing. Again, when, um, when businesses realized the value of women in terms of being able to sell their products, they um, started gearing products to them. Um, the Hearth and Home magazine became very popular. Every month, every issue had a quilt block. This is a book that I had, they had blocks of all the states. And, um, and that was definitely marketing. Women would you know, look forward to getting these and finding out what the latest, um, the latest patterns were. They held contests and, um, and so forth. Um, during the Depression, magazines needed to sell fashion and optimism in order to survive. And I think this is kind of an interesting story too. Um, They sold flour and sugar and those commodities in, ba in burlap bags. They discovered it was very difficult to tell one product from another. So one of the companies was called Gingham Flour, Gingham Girl. They started putting their flour in Gingham bags and they were just going off the shelf. I mean, they were just, they could. So the other, fee the other flour companies um, decided, well, that was a pretty good idea. So they started using um, patterns to sell their product. And here's a, an old feed sack that, um, that still has the label on it. They finally got smart and made the labels so that they washed out. So, you know, you didn't have to, but in early days, it was really hard to get the label off. And, um, you know, my Mother used to tell a story about going to the grocery store with her parents and her, you know, her, her dad having to move several things of, you know, chicken feed or whatever, flour or whatever, to get the right pattern so that um, her mother could finish whatever project she was working on. They went on to sell patterns. Here's a feed sack apron. That was one of them. Now it's a really coarse, and you can feel this, you know, at the end if you want to, it's very coarse. And I know that I'm over on time, but I saw this cute little poem that I have to read. Um, when I was just a maiden fair, a mama made our underwear. With many kids and dad's low pay, we had no fancy lingerie. No monograms or fancy stitches could brighten up those homely britches. No lace or ruffles to enhance, just pride of the prairie on my pants. <laughs> because. It was, I guess, very difficult to get that trademark um, off. I just thought that was kind of cute. Um, the feed sacks became, well, stayed popular through the 1940s because of war shortages. And, um, you know, quilting had kind of gone out of style for a while because as the women, you know, became more powerful and had more, they were trying to distance themselves from that. But I thought it was kind of interesting by the second Chicago World's Fair in um, 1933, it was back in style and there was a huge competition. This is a book, I just got this a couple weeks ago, so I haven't had a chance to really look at it, of all the designs that were from the 1933 quilt, um, quilt competition and a lot of those were made from feed sacks. So um, feed sacks, kind of went into style a couple years ago. There were a lot of feed stack repro um, repro reproduction fabrics, a lot of books. 
that were put out. Um, this is a quilt that I made, just kind of a simple thing out of, out of the feed sack um, reproduction fabric. And I have a picture that I want Joy to show that I thought was kind of interesting for local history. There's a picture of a man's bowling team from the Chase Bag Factory wearing, wearing shirts made of feed sacks. Okay, wrapping up. Today, today's quilts emphasize creativity. Fabric choices range from reproductions to batiks. Um, I have a, a batik quilt that I made just to give you an idea of the fabrics. I love batik fabrics. Um, this, this is made of all strips. It's called um, Hot Flash. And um, I thought it was appropriate. <laughs> and, but, you know, they're pre-cut, so all you have to do is stitch them. But the colors are so vibrant. And, you know, they're real popular um, right now. Another trend are, trip, you know, portrait or landscape quilts. This was one that won a prize, an art prize in, in um, Grand Rapids a couple years ago. And it's boats in a harbor. I mean, it's really... Spectacular, I've seen that one too. Um, I have one that I kind of started, another gimmick was something that was called um, Row by Row. And this was to get people to go to different um, quilt shops and every quilt shop sold a block or a little, well, it ended up being like a whole row. I got really into this until I realized what on earth was I gonna do with a whole bunch of rows of Amish, I mean, so I have a tendency to kind of change things. And I decided a little wall hanging. So that was the row. I combined a couple to do this. I haven't, obviously haven't finished it. But you know, that was cool for a while. But again, you know, I, my sister, well, I was given gifts of row by rows from other places. And I'm going, how am I ever going to put these, these together to come up with something um, cohesive? Um, they're still used for philanthropy. This is called um, the mothers and daughters pattern. This was a pattern that was part of a promotion to raise money for breast cancer research. You were supposed to, you know, do traditional breast, you know, pink and so forth. The other big fad going on at the time was Downton Abbey. So I decided it would be an interesting twist to do the mothers and daughters out of the Downton Abbey fabrics. So these are the Downton Abbey um, reproduction fabrics and all of those were designed to represent one of the ladies um, in the Downton series. And I guess you can just be um, as creative as you want to be. Album quilts, t-shirt quilts. I have, my son is still waiting for me to do the t-shirt quilt that I promised him a couple years ago and I will absolutely have it done by Christmas. Um, but I thought there was an interesting quote by um, a man who's a, he's a woman studies pro professor at the um, St. Louis University. And he wrote a book on the folklore of quilting but um, quietly, steadily, consciously, the American woman has been quilting for hundreds of years, preserving material, recording history through fabric, remembering family or friends with colorful scraps, and without fanfare, creating a work of original art. The woman was the first conservator, the uneducated but accurate historian, the keeper of tradition, and the definer of the American um, character. I received a gift that really touched me from a friend at Christmas that I think illustrates um, that. It was a pillow that she made. And I guess my ending point is, you don't have to be a master quilter to create memories for your family. I think it's the important thing is doing it. Um, and I'm just gonna read you the part that she wrote, the beginning part. In the early 1900s, my grandmother pieced the square 100 years later, I quilted it with care. My gift to you is a piece of my history 
celebrating our shared love of stitchery. So, I mean, that really touched me, you know, to be able to share that because I had helped her work on a quilt project and, you know, she knew how much I loved quilting and I treasure this, this pillow. Um, I've come up with other things. This is a kind of a dumb thing that I did for me and this is the end. I like Brighton charms. Whenever I would go to a state, I would go find a Brighton store and buy a charm. Well, I've been to a lot of states and I have shoulder problems to begin with, so I certainly couldn't wear that. So I found that map and thought, you know, this is just kind of a way of me marking the states that I've been to and um, not having to wear it on my wrist. And so I guess my message is share your history. You know, um, my 30 year old son, I don't think is going to be terribly interested at this point in his life with, you know, some of the quilts I've made, but he will treasure the t-shirt quilt that he's been after me to make for three years. So maybe five years. So um, I think we have a responsibility, I guess, to our families to share that history and um, recognize our role in that. <laughs>